Welcome, welcome, welcome back to Bleeding Blue, a show about the history of the New York football giants. My name is Justin Pennick, alongside one of my best friends in the entire world, Nikki Snacks. And Snacks, we are starting one of our favorite things that we do at the, throughout the entire offseason, and that is we're starting to read a book. We're reading. We're reading. Oh, yeah. We're intelligent. We're reading. Well, I mean... We're very intelligent human beings. Well, kind of. We know how to read. Let's put it that way. We do know how to read. Uh, really, the origins of this show is us reading No Medals for Trying. Yep. Number one. And then If These Walls Could Talk. If These Walls Could Talk. If These Walls Could Talk. That's how we kind of kind of brought back this show, revitalized this show as a Giants history show. And now we have the Big 50, the men in the moments that made the New York Giants by Patricia Trania. Yes. And uh, it's... So far, we've read we've read I I would say like six seven chapters yep. or so, and um it's a phenomenal book. I highly recommend it to everybody. And actually, no, I'm demanding you get it because we're gonna be doing some Twitter Spaces. Yes, and our, our book club we're we're gonna we're gonna talk about the book in the Twitter Spaces, and we would we would love to join you. I know Westicles will be in there. Danny Behan will be in there. Yeah, West Lock, Wesley Westicles. He this is, is actually, his idea. It was his, his idea. idea. He yep. said we need to do some kind of book club when you guys read your books. How can we kind of follow along with you and kind of have these conversations with you? And then, boom, Twitter spaces were made, and that's like the perfect way to do it. So if you're on social media, if you're on Twitter, um, and you're watching this on YouTube, you're listening to this on a podcast app, make make a Twitter solely for the purpose of joining this book club. Buy this book. I gave away two copies, yep. so we're getting knee deep into it, and I'm going to be putting out in social media, um, you know, the chapters that we're going to be talking about. It's basically going to mod like model. And mirror what we're going to be talking about on the show. Correct. So. And uh, it, it's a pretty awesome concept. We the books are the books are very fun. We did Coughlin's book last year too. Yes. Um, which was a lot of fun talking lot of about fun. the i I'm sorry. A lot of fun. Oh, a lot of fun. Yeah. And um, so so that was good. But but this is just something that that we can all engage in. I know we do the the premiere on YouTube, which you're you're watching now, or if you're listening beforehand, watch it six o'clock Monday. Um, but this is just another avenue where we can all discuss Giants history. Yeah. And uh, now everybody's got a little bit more excited excitement about the present day Giants, mm. talking about their history and the great moments and how we were really born to, you know, born to life as the New York Football Giants is is something that's pretty cool and we want you all to be a part of it. So yeah, um, thank you in this journey and as you can see, we are we're in a cool studio. We're in a cool studio. Yeah, um, this is all like our first time. That's it. That's in this. We're in this. Studio, that's right. So. so Bleeding Blue got a. Uh, a million and a half dollar sponsor from a company and they bought a, an office for us. So that's where we're, Huge. we're at now. Yeah. Huge. Wow. Yeah. Million and a half. A yeah, million and a half. 1.5 mil. I should have probably went a little higher than that. Yeah. Well, you want to be John humble. Boy, the John Boy Media Studios is, is a beautiful place. Very cool. Um, I am, I'm very appreciative to be here and it's, it's awesome. So let's, uh, you want to talk about the the origins of New York Football Giants? Yeah, um, you were mentioning just you know talk, like the history of the Giants and the origins of the Giants, and that's what we're reading about. And then the origins of this podcast is in books. Yep. Well, how we're going to start off talking about the Big Fifty is the origin of the Giants with Tim Mara playing at the Polo Grounds and him buying the team in the early days of the team and, and the then struggles, even and the struggles. But also, I kind of want to contextualize also how the game of football grew and how the Maras started with Tim, but then Wellington Mara really took it to another level on being dedicated to not only growing the Giants, but growing the game of football and the decisions that particularly Wellington made. It's like one of the main reasons why the game is the way that it is. And also talking about the greatest game ever played, yes. which grew, which naturally kind of grew the game of football just by a product on the field. They say the greatest game ever played, the Giants versus the Colts, is the catalyst of what the NFL is today. Yeah. And it's funny, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, but, you know, it's a game with eight fumbles, six loss, yeah. an interception. It's like mm -hmm. a sloppy game. Yeah. But it was, you know, and again, we're going to talk about it, and I'll just rip it off right, right away. It was the first overtime game. So everything, the first game that was nationally televised, yep. it, it was just something that really brought into full fruition the NFL and how we view it today, really. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it, it catalyst. Everything else that we love and cherish about the NFL, but um, Tim Mara, I, I, let's 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 yep. get right into it. So Tim Mara, you know, we, we we think of Wellington Mara when we think of the Giants. You know, he was the owner, and uh, you know, Tim Mara was for, I guess, in their, what was it? 
early 20s 1925 1925 yeah oh obviously that's when he bought the team that's when he bought the team right but we think about wellington mara and, and you know obviously there, there's some older people that were alive for tim mara I, it's a joke uh, everybody's probably dead mm -hmm. but he bought it for 500 bucks yeah and my favorite part about this is that he was a he was a bookmaker so he he dropped out of school at 13 years old his father passed away he wanted to help support his widowed mother to help support his family and he was pretty much a bookie. And he was running games left and right. And he had no football knowledge. Like, he was not a football guy at all. And the NFL had, I, I want to say, who did they have in mind? They had two guys in mind. Yeah, it was uh, basically Billy Gibson. One of those Billy guys Gibson, was Billy right. Gibson. Boxing he, promoter. These were boxing guys. Boxing yes. promoter and, and uh, manager. Yeah. Right. And Tim Mara's like, Okay, well, for five hundred bucks, I think this is an investment worth doing. In today's inflation, that would be seventy five hundred dollars. Which is just imagine, I would do that right now. Yeah, I well, would I mean, buy sports, an NFL team for seventy five hundred. Sports and football was not, you no. know, the way the way that it was. Obviously, no, so. exactly. But but to have a guy at, at that young of age and a bookmaker, nonetheless, which to me is so funny, buying an NFL team. I think it's you, inspiring for you. It, well, it could be. You're right. I mean. Maybe I'll hit the Powerball. Um, by the way, I'm very good friends with Verizon now, so if you guys need any help, uh, I got an in with them. Yeah, you um, do. Sorry, I, I needed to mention that at some point. But it, it it's so, so funny how things are so drastically different from about 100 fucking years ago. Mm -hmm. There's one. Um, you could buy a team for 500 bucks as a bookmaker. Yeah. If you're a bookmaker now and you're trying to buy an NFL team, you're going to get laughed off the stage. Mm -hmm. Literally laughed off the stage. So Tim Mara buys the New York football giants for 500 bucks. And Justin, what, what I find funny is the success that he thought he would have in the return of investment was not the case. No. no. At all. And it's a, it's a willingness. I think it's a willingness by the Maris. And it's, it all starts with Tim. It all starts with yeah. Tim. Because there's, there's one year where he loses like $60,000 because he's signing guys to year-long contracts because uh, he doesn't want to lose them to the AFL. So there are certain he was paying things. Him, yeah, he was paying him extra to keep yeah. them and losing money out of his pocket. And, and those year-long contracts, you know, the way the game of football was really working, you know, at least from what I believe, is that guys, you would either sign week-to-week -week contracts, half-season. You wouldn't sign, okay, just because you signed a contract doesn't mean you're playing for all X amount of games that are in that season. It's not that guaranteed money that we see nowadays. They would they would have their 9-5 to five jobs Monday through Friday. Right. And, then, and, then and then they're Sunday, playing football on Sunday. And then yeah. Sunday they put the, uh, you know, the, the, the leather helmets on and then yep. they're, they're, they're going to work there. So um, it was not obviously what it is now, and I think everybody obviously knows that. But it, it, the investment that he put into the Giants, eventually like – it be he had this vision and he had the idea that because it's in New York, because we're we're they they did have early success too. They did win games. It was just an element of okay, we're winning games, but we're not putting fans in the stands, and that was the main. And issue we're not making money. money, right? Yeah. Yes. So so the Giants obviously we know they're a pioneer of the NFL. Like they're one of the the greatest franchises yeah. the NFL's ever had. They're they're historic. They were at the start of the NFL and to this day, but you don't put fans in the stands you're not making any money yeah and when you're not making any money then you look to sell or something like that that you know of that of that nature so he and it's funny i, I want to talk a little bit about you know jump jump around a little bit i'm you know me i'm stupid and my timelines are always off but so he's at the polo grounds mm -hmm. couldn't bring anybody in right goes to yankee stadium yep couldn't bring anybody in yep so what's funny to me is he was making the schedule it was like manufacturing games yeah right. so it was against the chicago bears yes um this, Harold... is, this is the big one this is the big one so he thought we you know the giants were good they they had winning records they they did all these things but still nobody would come football was new here yep and he justin take this over because he knew he needed stars in the building and this is where i think everything else took off. Yeah, so the Giants played the Chicago Bears, and Tim Mara made sure that he kind of manufactured that that game would happen in New York. And Harold Red Grange. Who the Giants tried to he tried yeah. to sign, and yeah. they, they couldn't get him. He signed with the Bears. So Harold Red Grange, who he had like a pick six in that game. The Giants lost that game. Yes. He had like a pick six in that game. He had a rushing touchdown. He had like three passing attempts. Like the Harold Red Grange was this, you know, star player who just kind of did everything for the Bears. And that did fill the seats. It was a yep. it was a highly sold out game for um at at Janky Stadium at the time. Janky so. Stadium, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's funny how that works. Like imagine imagine somebody now it's like a I guess 
almost like a Debo Samuel mm-hmm. that you could say that would throw the ball, play defense, pick six. Tony. He throws the ball. Very good at it. Don't get me started on that motherfucker. I really, I'm not, I'm not doing, this. I'm not doing this today. I'm talking about the history. I don't, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about present day busts. Yeah, like Kayvon Thibodeau and Evan Neal. And then okay? eventually, CC Pyle. Don't know who that is, but he's looking to buy the rights of another team to also play at Yankee Stadium, or whether the Giants are at the Polo Grounds at this time. You know what? You know whatever. The, the years are kind of blending in a, a, a little bit for me. But CC Pyle's looking to buy another franchise, football franchise, and they and he did buy the rights for them for the New York Yankees, for the New York Football Yankees, to play at Yankee Stadium. And Tim Mara was not happy about that. No, not happy because as a as an owner who was already kind of struggling to get fans in the stands. And that was the main point of revenue. Obviously, there's no there's no TV there's no TV revenue and stuff like that. We'll get to TV revenue. Yes, we will. But um, you know was, uh, that that was the main point of emphasis of revenue, and he was struggling with that. So this is a quote that I really like: "A franchise a franchise is worthless if it didn't include a certain degree of territorial rights," which makes me think about the Jets. Ooh, wow. like that that's yeah, that's where my right. brain territorial right yeah that's, that's where my brain mm. went to. Now, at least Tim, what Tim said and what Tim made, it's like he eventually agreed to it. He initially said no. But like the Maras usually do, at least you know we're talking about when football was kind of developing and Wellington and Tim. Maybe not John. Yeah, please. <laughs> With the celebration shit. Please. But, uh, but uh, you know, Tim eventually said, all right, we'll do it. But again, I need to manufacture that schedule. I need to right. make sure that we're not playing – Two games in New York simultaneously at the same time because then I'm sacrificing my own revenue for other fans going to another stadium. Yeah. So it's funny how he, I mean, guy was a good businessman. Like, he knew the ins and outs, clearly. I mean, you may look at it, but he dropped out. Of, okay. I, I, you I know. You may look about it in the short term, and there's probably newspaper articles that are maybe written. I'm, I'd be interested to see if this was the case. Are there newspaper articles being written on, wow, the Giants are losing money? The Giants are not a good business. I'm sure, yeah. And, at the time, it's like this is a failing, failing franchise. It's a failing business, not even just a franchise. Because the franchise was winning games, but Tim Merritt and the Maris, they were still losing money because yeah. they just weren't having people show up. So I wonder at the time if there are articles being written like, oh, you know, is this a failing Is this a failing business? Um, but obviously, as it turned out, it was not. And yeah. it kind of did quickly. It, it quickly turned around relatively soon. Yeah, and it, so, so that's the thing. And it, to me, it's... When you own a football team, that's your number your number one priority is making money, right? Yeah. You want to invest in something five hundred dollars or five billion nowadays, you need to make money. If not, it's a failed it's a failed experiment. Mm-hmm. So the fact that he was able to have control of who his team plays and who comes into his stadium and which stars and everything like this is so wacky to me that it's crazy. I mean, I I get it. Nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties. Yeah. It's a completely different ball game. But the fact that he was able to tailor everything that he wanted to make money is genius. astonishing. It's it, genius. It, it's, it's genius. It's genius. And yeah. that's why I say he's a good businessman. And he was a young guy. Like he, what you were saying before, he dropped out of school at 13 years old. Mm-hmm. Bookmaking at 18 years old. He just got into his own different thing. And the fact that he made this smart investment and was able to, I, I'm, I'm reading it right now. Um, what was it? The, their first season, they went eight and four. Yeah. He lost forty thousand dollars though. Yeah. Like, to me, if you lose forty thousand dollars first year, like, okay, what, what, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. Why did I spend this this money that I could have used elsewhere for my family for 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 something else? When the AFL came around, he lost sixty thousand. dollars He lost sixty thousand. Exactly. Yeah. I was gonna get to that. Exactly. And he's trying to sign. And here's another thing. He's trying to sign marquee guys. Do anybody remember Jim Thorpe was a New York Giant? Nineteen twenty five. Nineteen twenty five. Jim Thorpe was a New York Giant for three games. Three games. That's it. We didn't we didn't get the Jim Thorpe. No, we got we the didn't. corpse of Jim Thorpe. But it's just it's those little things that that you're trying to nowadays you don't need to bring in stars to make money. You're going to yeah. make money. Back then, you need these these high key guys that are these star guys, these names to bring in and make money. And Tamara yeah, kind of perfected the craft. Yeah. All right, so before we get into Wellington and some some of the things that that he did. Yes. So we're going to put Tim to bed. Tim the well he's he's been he's dead also, for a he's while. He's also yeah. dead. He's been dead for a while. I want to ask you Uh-oh. five things. If you were to buy the Giants, yep, right now, money's yep. not an issue. We're in the year 2022. 
You can do whatever you want. Yeah. Five things that you would change about the Giants. What would you do? All right. Well, one. If number one, if, no, if we don't have the same number one, and this is priority, by the way. List it by priority. Yeah, yeah, I know. And if number one, if we don't have number one is the same thing, it's I abomination. I actually have it on my phone. Well, you know what? You're right. We probably don't, though. What's your number one? I'm burning MetLife Stadium to the ground. I'm destroying MetLife yeah. Stadium. <laughs> I am burning MetLife Stadium <laughs> to the ground. And I am bringing all Giants fans to watch to it burn. It. Yes. We are burning MetLife Stadium to the ground. We're building a state-of-the-art facility. Mm. Keep the practice facility because that's beautiful. Yeah. It's a really gorgeous facility and the practice field's great. MetLife Stadium is the biggest piece of fucking shit I've ever seen in my life. And yeah. I want it burnt immediately. That's okay. the first thing I'm doing. All right. I signed the papers. I'm getting fire. Like, the, the woman with the with the dragons and Game of Thrones, I want them to burn it to the Oh, you want a ground. dragon to just spit burn it to the fire. Yeah. Okay. Burn it to the ground, and I want to build a state-of-the-art facility. So I, we're in agreement with that? Yes, that is number one for me. I'm All glad right. we have the same number one. I'm glad, too. I then want to switch back to the old Giants uniforms. I want the Giants. I want this way. Okay. I want the Giants on the helmet. I think the color rush is so beautiful. I don't need the color. I want it back to the old ways. Okay. I kind of like it. I, don't, I, I like it as an alternate. And you could do the alternate more often. Maybe two home games a year. Yeah, but I want a blue alternate. We only have white. It's true. I think the white looks clean, though. Like the, the, white, best, the white looks very clean. One of the best decisions that they ever made was switching to those white pants. Yeah, I love cool. the white. The, yeah, gray, cool. gray, the gray The gray is like ominous. Gray yeah. made your ass look big. Kevin, Kevin just Booth. just Kevin Booth. Great yeah. ass, yeah. I don't think it's great. No, it's great, disgusting. It's cottage cheese. Great, man. great meaning it's big, but I don't it's know about huge. great. Like it's about the size of New Jersey, I'll tell you that. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So maybe, maybe the maybe the the uniform shouldn't be number two on my priority list. Well, you want to know what my number I two is? I do love. I do love the old uniforms. Though. Yeah. No. No. I so. think they should they should switch around with some different uniform stuff, and you may you may see that this year. Um, Interesting. Number two for me. I would Spartan kick the G line. Oh, it's number five. Not Spartan kick. I'd get rid of the G line I would, in total. No Spartan kill kick. Them. Spartan kick into yeah. a pit. <laughs> Maybe not kill. They're, they're probably good people. But they're just doing their jobs. I hate the G I line. I hate the G line. Hate the G line. And that is number two. Like I, I hate them so much that it is number two on my list. It's funny because we're tailgating. They come around like, shut, shut up, mm -hmm. shut up. We don't want to hear this. It doesn't pump us up. It doesn't do anything. It annoys us. Yeah. Also, because here's the thing: at the stadium. They'll play on the field, but then there's microphones that go out on the speakers. And how science works, at least uh, what I think, it takes time for sound to travel. So I hear them playing on the field, and then they're like two beats behind on the speakers. So it's just like, it just, it fucking just mess. sounds so awful. It's just a mess. Like if you weren't putting it on the loudspeakers, then maybe I'd be like, all right, I could just hear you okay. Yeah. But no, it's it's just a disaster. No, it's That's my number two. And and, and the, the, the guy in the loudspeaker is like, uh, welcome to G Line, and nobody gets pumped. Oh, also, right. also, can I, can I say? You could say. When they say the G Line for years, I would just, I'm waiting for the announcer to mess up and say the G Spot. For years, I've been waiting for that to happen. If that does, I think we win the Super Bowl. I will. I will. I think I may, I think I may spontaneously combust out of just laughter. Yeah. I I've been know. waiting. I've been waiting since they started it to say that. I, I think I was a child, and I knew what the G-spot was. I don't even know. You were a child, and you know what the G-spot was? I mean, like a teen. You know, tw yeah, 12. You've heard of it. 12? You've heard of it. Come yeah. on. It's a, listen, it's a good spot. All right, what's your number three? My number three. It's a good spot. It's a good spot to be in. Uh, scrubbing Tiki Barber's name and all statistics from Giants history. Oh yeah, yeah. Just erase it. Erase it. Yeah. Cancel him. Really? Yes. I think that's what I you're want doing. him out. Yeah. Okay. No, I, but I'm I'm serious. Like our viewers and our listeners know my feelings. Can he exist on WFAN? What does that make him? No, no. He's fine. He's fine on WFAN. Yeah. Okay. But in Giants lore, he's in the Ring of Honor, right? Yes. Get him out. Okay. All right. He's the the leading rusher in Giants history, right? Yes. Not anymore. Okay. Not I don't want doesn't any. Exist. I he does not exist in Giants in Giants lore. He does not exist. Okay. And I want one day, one game a year where he comes out and everybody's allowed to boo and throw tomatoes at him. Oh, nice tomatoes. Yeah. Jersey tomatoes, the best. Mm. All right. Can Fuck I give, him. Can I give my number three? Yeah. Hire nerds who can explain things to me like I'm a first grader. That is my number three. I want nerds everywhere. Gee, there's a surprise. I want nerds who know the tickets i want nerds who know the players i want nerds who know the game of football and i just want them to here's the thing they don't even need to work for the team 
They just need to work for me and explain things to me about what other people are doing. What other nerds are doing? What other nerds are doing. I will hire other nerds. The nerds explain to you what other nerds are doing. Correct. That is what I would do. Because that's how I kind of need, like, the game of football explained to me. Especially when it comes to the stats stuff. I don't do... I don't really do any of the stats stuff that I kind of put out and I talk about. It's I get it from sites and I kind of just... I get it from other nerds. Right. Yeah. So that's that's, that's what I want. That's really nerdy. Number four. Number four. um, I'm getting rid of PSLs. Getting rid of PSLs. And that's a a great idea. Because I think it's... I didn't think of I think it's barbaric that you have to pay a PSL. It's like a down payment on a fucking house. It's ridiculous. And especially nowadays... I'll talk nowadays. Especially when the team has been so god-awful for a decade. You're making people... Put a down payment, and then just for another payment after that. You're you're putting so how, if you don't know what PSLs means, uh, pieces of shit like losers. That's that's really it's really what it is. And basically, is if you want to become a regular season ticket holder for the Giants, you need to pay X amount of money depending on what section you want to sit in. Pumpkin and, spice latte. Nope, I don't think that's what it means. You need to pay a certain price to just own the rights to the seats to just own them now why i think that they did that is number one they wanted to make money of course number two the old stadium before they tore down that stadium for they implode they imploded it personal seat license personal seat license so before they did that there was a waiting list that was up the wazoo and snacks and i we were put on that list when we were both born when we were born the day we were born yeah we didn't get the phone call until they built the new stadium Yep. We did not get that phone call of our names being on the waiting list until then. So I can also understand where you now it's really like prioritizing people that can really, really afford it versus people that can maybe just pseudo afford it. Right. And that's what sucks is that you're paying a certain price just to own the seats and then you still need to pay every single year for the season tickets of that year. Yep. But it is a one time price, the PSLs. I, I get it, but but it's still it just a lot. should not it's be a in lot place. of money. It's a lot of money. And we look around the, around the NFL. Nobody and, else does that. Nobody else does it. And MetLife Stadium, shit life stadium, sorry, the big fucking air conditioner that it is, it's it's quiet. It gets loud sometimes, but you look around the NFL and it's all these things. And to me, I go back to the PSLs because you got rich people buying these seats. Well, there's no character. There's, there's no character. There's no character, the character whatsoever. Left. The character of the stadium left. Yes. When they... When they... Not even when... They, not even because I, I I will say 2011 2012, that was fun. It had some energy, yeah. You know, 2010 too. You know that 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 team was still pretty pretty decent, except they just they choked games too. late. Oh. You know, so it it, it still char- lacked character. The character's though, gone. You know, the character's gone. Yeah, it, it, it's just it, everything. It, it's corporate now. There's no the, the real fans. Whatever. Yeah. Like the older guys, they sit down low, and if you're sitting down low and you're standing up for third down, you're getting asked to sit down. Like. Yeah, it's just it, it, it's it's a different vibe, and I I don't know I to me I would get rid of PSLs yeah. first day of the job. So that was number four for you. That was number four. Yeah. Yeah, I would say make better contact with PSL holders like the Yankees okay. do. That's cool. Yeah. Now the difference between the Yankees and the Giants, and I I'm I'm not I don't have the stats on this, but I think just it makes sense in my brain. There's more PSL holders for. The Giants than there are for the Yankees or would, like season assume. ticket holders. I would assume, but yeah. you also have to think of it like this: for like a, like Yankees or the Mets. Now the Mets could probably take care good care of their season ticket holders too, but I just don't know. But I was a season ticket holder for Fuck the Yankees the Mets, for two yeah. years, and they took very very good care of me. The people would fucking call me on the phone. They would call me like, I, "Wish I you had your birthday and shit." Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, like, yeah. "Are you okay?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm cool. <laughs> you don't need to you go on with your life, bro. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm good." Um, but um, you know, I would make better contact and make a better effort to make sure that everything's cool everything's good everything's okay like hey here's the events that we have going on here's what we're offering here are all the things that we offer i don't know like the emails i don't even know how to change this in my email inbox i don't all the emails that i get from the giants they go to like my promotions they don't go to my main inbox yeah yeah so like the yankees on, Yan- on the gmail yeah. the yankees they go to my main inbox so right. i see what they're sending me the giants now it's i'm sure it's just a setting i need to change but still like i if, if there are certain incentives that i'm getting as a psl holder i'm not getting all of them and that sucks so i would make better contact and i don't know if i have a one set person who's like my 
Like your rep. My rep. R- your rep. Yeah. My my buddy's a, a Ranger season ticket holder. He has a rep. I don't. I don't think the Giants do that. I yeah. think because there's so many of this them. Is, this that's is the good, issue. I, I get that, but but I would make you that could effort. Ass, you can assign a rep to 25 season ticket yeah, holders. I'm like you're the Giants. Make that. Make it happen. Make that effort. Yeah, if you, you're all about family and making sure that your PSL you're holders are family, yeah. like then you better hire more more ticket people if to have those reps. That's and that's the thing. Welling tomorrow to his fault. Giants are a family. Everything's yeah. a family. You're right. You're they, they talked about it in the Big 50. The Big 50, there was a quote that Wellington or John, I'm pretty sure it was Wellington, Fuck John. It was said that, hey, I'm I like treating the PSL holders and treating the regular season ticket holders like family. That's that's in this book that we are reading. Yes. So, all no, right, what's true. number five? Let's wrap up. So I had, I had the G-line, but I'm, I, I thought of something. Um, sure. I'm going to beat you to it. Mm-hmm. Open training camp to the public. Damn it. That was my <laughs> number five. Every single. You took my G-line one. So. Every single training camp practice. Open, open it up. to the public. Yes. Open it up. Yes. I, there's no reason not to now. Yeah. There's if no the, reason. If, I will say if there's coaches, I will. If I'm the owner, I will say coaches, you can designate practices that if you really want to have private with no media. Fine. Fine. Then fans shouldn't yeah. be there either. I can fans understand Fans are reporting yeah. everything. Right. But open it up. Open it up. Keep it free. It, I don't mind charging for sausage and beer and whatever like that, like they usually do. I don't mind that because, they, hey, they are still making money even though the tickets are free. But do no, it. I, do it. I am, do that. I'm in full agreement, and I know how much you love camp. We went to we went to Massachusetts last year. We watched yeah. Giants, Giants, Patriots live. And it was uh, awesome. It was terrific. They put, on, they put on a really good— They did. It was really cool. And they also have—now, they didn't have a lot of stands because also you have to— th- it, it fails a comparison. How many people showed up for Patriots camp versus how many people show up to Giants camp? Yeah. There, it was like maybe 20% of the people yeah. less in Massachusetts. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, that's, absolutely. So that's the thing that the Giants have to manage. It's like, yeah, is it kind of a bad view, especially when you have multiple fields and the Patriots, the, that practice was such a great view. We were literally right fucking there. We, right can, there. Hear, we can hear what Joe Judge is screaming to these guys. To um, the hell! To the... To the <laughs> uh, rest in peace, Joe Judge. Yeah, re- rest in peace. He did die. I miss him. Um, so that's the thing where you, there's so many people. So you maybe you can't put all the people that are that close, and you can't have you know you, you got to have the fence up, whatever. But make make every single training camp make 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 open. it happen, will you? Yeah, please. All right, I want to wrap up. Wrap up. Talking about two different things. Is we're one, gonna is one the Duke. We're gonna talk about Wellington Mara. Um, particularly what he chose to do TV revenue-wise. Yes. So there eventually came a fork in the road where, you know, hey, there's there's TVs in the world, the NFL is being broadcasted, et cetera, et cetera. So the NFL commissioner's office and the owners, uh, you know, they're probably negotiating, how are we going to split up this TV revenue? Is New York going to get more money because New York is the biggest market in the nation? It's the biggest market in the world. Are they going to get more money? Um, and Wellington Mara was one of those deciders on, is it going to be market-based or is it going to be, you know, split evenly across all teams? And Wellington Mara was one of the first owners to say it should be split up equally. And then the rest of the owners kind of followed suit. And then that's the way it is now. And I think that's one of the main reasons why NFL is king. Yeah, you know, pioneer of really propelling that money source. Yeah, to everybody. Yeah, and look at it now. Like, there's a reason. Can... There's a reason. It's called Duke. Yeah, like his name, the Duke, is on every single football and every single game yeah. of every single year. And that just wasn't about making money in the short term because he could have said, "Making money in the short term, I want all the money for myself, and I want to take more revenue because I'm in New York and I'm in the New York market." But it was better for the Giants, and I think it was better for the game in the long run because maybe the game wouldn't be, maybe the NFL wouldn't be the NFL if it was so market based. Right. It is not market based. Not at all. Not we, at all. We, we were talking off camera. It's like the Yankees have the Yes Network. Yes. Uh, the Dodgers have their network. The Giants don't have their network. Yeah. No team has their network. So MLB, they split the national revenue for the nationally televised games. So it's not like, hey, you know, the top, one of the Tigers getting an ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Never. They Never. Yeah. So. That doesn't mean that they're not getting the national revenue that baseball makes off of those games. Right. But the local networks, that's the thing. And that's the thing that separates, uh, you know, like basketball, baseball from football is that the Giants games aren't just broadcasted on MSG. Yeah. They're broadcasted on Fox. On Fox. Now, nationally televised. Yeah. I would love 
love because we do bitch and moan about these announcers. I would love if there were some more local announcers that were included in those games. That would be cool. Yeah. Um, kind of like, like like Kenny Albert doing the Giants games. Yeah. He's a local, you know, local yeah. New York guy. Does the Rangers. Yeah, and not Sam Rosen. You and know, you, and you do look at the S Network like with the Yankees. It is such a professional broadcast. It's unbelievable. Like yeah. Michael K, David Cohn, David. You know, both of those guys are now they're doing stuff with ESPN. Michael K yeah. does does the yep. the, the K Rod stuff. K Rod and, and, uh, and Cohn's the Sunday play, baseball. Uh, the, the the color analyst. Yeah. So it's not like it's impossible for guys to be unbiased. But I think you turn on any other game around the country, it's very different. Oh, it is that, very yeah. Homer centered. And, and stuff like that. Just so. look at Judge's home run the other night. Wait, did you hear that the Blue Jays announced? <laughs> no. Oh, God. It was, it's very funny. Very Homer. Yeah. Very Homer? Yeah. Okay. So, I can imagine that could be an issue. But, still, I love the way that the game of football is split up, split up like that. And I think that's how you have to do it. Yeah. There's and that's why it's so successful. Too, yeah. Because I think, I hear, I, I was looking it up on the internet. It was the game of football. How much does MLB divide... Um. It's revenue share. So each team, 30, 30 teams, each team receives more than $110 million through revenue sharing every single year. That's what re- that does not count the local networks. No, that's, right, just, right. that's just MLB that's just, that's revenue. How sharing. they spread it out. And you got teams like the fucking pirates and the A's that won't spend a dime. Right. That's that's embarrassing. But it's embarrassing. Every football team gets like almost three times that. Well, of course. three times that. Of course. But then you have, the unequal split of competition in games like baseball, where you do have the Dodgers, they're willing to have that luxury tax because they make so much money in other places versus other teams. They don't make the the TV revenue and they don't have that extra revenue. So they don't want to spend that money versus the Dodgers. They feel like they can spend that money because their local TV networks are making so much fucking money. And that is the unequal, unfair kind of divide versus football. You don't have that. There is so much parity in football and that's why the the whole strength of schedule thing is always fascinating in a year out year up basis yep. because a team that's bad the previous year you have one of the easiest schedules and then boom like you you can see a team go worst to first you see that every year in the National Football League and it's just a normal thing because that's just the parity that they have and not every sport has that and that's no. why football is so cool and that's why it's king Wellington Mayor he Wellington was one Mayor. of the guys that you can kind of credit him for that the Duke. Pretty damn cool, I will say. Yeah. And um, I know we're going to wrap up, but something about Wellington, which, by the way, he got into, like, the Giants' front office as Father Hyatt when he was, like, 14 years old. So let, let, let's say that, which mm-hmm. is just crazy. And uh, also his brother died. His brother his brother Jack, yeah. 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 So, and then he took on more of Respect. a role after that, and that was with player personnel and yes. the player selection meeting. That's right. You mean the NFL draft? Yes. <laughs> The player selection meeting, otherwise known today as the NFL draft. But uh, so he was in that. Um, once a giant, always a giant, right? That's what Wellington said. Yes. And nothing makes it like more clear than oh, this, yes, I love this, this story. story. So Rich Soybert, as we know, Talking Giants has interviewed Rich. Uh, horrific leg injury in 2001. Like mm-hmm. could have been amputated. Um, Wellington Mari was just, wasn't just an owner. He's like, I'm on record saying he's like one of the guys. He loves his players. Yeah. He sat in on team meetings. Um, he knew all game plans for offense and defense. Like yeah. he was, this was his life. Yeah. Before he got really involved with the league stuff, all the stuff that he yes. was involved with the league, he was in nitty gritty every single day. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, other, other owner, well, almost every other owner has business entities outside of their team. Yeah. Wellington Mara and, and you know, Mara, Mara, and John Matt, this is their life. They don't yeah. have anything else. So when Rich Cyber got literally almost amputated, Wellington Mara every single day sat bedside when when Cybert was in the hospital yeah. for three weeks. He sat there every single day. He would come in. He would update Rich on how the Giants are doing, what's going on at practice, and everything like that. He provided for his wife Jody. He provided everything he needed. Yeah, that's an owner of a guy, an undrafted free agent, mind you, who might not even make the team. And Wellington sitting there bedside and doing that. Yeah. And Rich was like reluctant to open up. Yes. Rich talks about it. He goes, goes, I don't even know if I'm going to be on the team tomorrow. Yeah. I don't want to open up to the owner of the team. I barely do that to the coaches of the team. Which I understand. Yeah. You know, you're talking to the most powerful guy of your employer. Yep. Where you're employed. But Wellington didn't matter. He would go to the hospital. He'd sit there with Rich. He would talk to Rich. He'd up to 
How awesome is that? When I was when I was reading that 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 blurb that you give know, me chills. The trainer wrote. I was I was on the train reading it. And I was like, uh, this is you get like butterflies in your skin, literally. You know? It gave me chills. My the, the hairs on my arm stood up when I yeah. read it. And he, it once a giant, always a giant. It's a real thing. And Unless he, you're Tiki Barber. I think he's from Wisconsin. I think that's where he's, yeah, he's from. He's from Wisconsin. Then he moved after retirement. He moved to California. And then Rich is on record saying. I missed my Giants family so much. He moved back to Jersey, and now he's the head coach of the Watchung Hills football team. Crazy, in New Jersey. It? Yeah, Wellington. He's he was loyal to a fault. It's what got the Giants in a lot of trouble numerous yeah. times. His son's the same way, but uh, that's pretty. That's some special yeah. shit. So, I want to wrap up talking about the greatest game ever played. Please, please. Nineteen fifty-eight. The Giants lost. In the 1958 championship game, they, they lost did. to the Baltimore Colts. Uh, Johnny Unitas led. Uh, we- Weeb <laughs> Allbank was the coach of the Baltimore Colts, and then Jim Jim Lee Howe was the coach of the Giants. They lost 23 to 17 at Janky Stadium Sunday de- Sunday December 28th 1958. This was a very very important game. Snacks. Yes, it was the first. First televised game in football history. Nationally televised. Nationally televised. I'm sorry. Nationally televised game in football history. Now, there's but, something funny about it. Yeah, if you lived in New York, you couldn't watch it. <laughs> well, that part makes me laugh, too. However, as we mentioned before, the game went to overtime. In overtime, yeah. when the Colts are driving, the biggest possession of the game, NBC blacked out. <laughs> Nobody could see anything. The game was blacked out. I think, I think they finally got it back on where people could see, but... Yeah. And they actually Are you called, kidding me? They called a timeout on the they field. They called a timeout on the field because they were like, the station please, blacked out. Please, please. This cannot fucking begging, go down. Begging, begging, begging. And this was the first overtime game yes. ever. So it probably went on longer than they expected, and that's maybe why it blacked out. I'm just, you know, connecting yeah, yeah, yeah. dots or yeah. whatever the case. But in the biggest moment of the biggest game <laughs> ever, it blacks out. We can't have this. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Imagine that happening nowadays. What would... The remote, the video. The Super Bowl. This is the Super Bowl. This is the Super Bowl. Videos that you'd see on Twitter and Instagram of remotes being thrown through the, the TV the that internet, it blacked out. The internet would crash because everybody would be freaking the fuck out. It would be unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. So I, I always thought that to be absolutely hysterical. And, you know, my other thing that's hysterical is it's the greatest game ever played and it's probably the sloppiest game ever played. Yeah, it was, you, you have the numbers, right? Eight fumbles, six for a loss, one interception thrown by the great Johnny Unitas. Mm-hmm. Really? Seven turnovers and it's the greatest football game ever? Yeah. Well, <laughs> really? The, well, it's also you have to consider, I think, the stars that were that were out. You know, because you have, uh, well, and, I'm going to, Pat Summerall isn't really a superstar because he was a kicker. Superstar. Pat Summerall was a kicker for the Giants at this time. Lo and behold, he goes on to be, you know. Uh, the greatest broadcaster ever. The greatest ever. broadcaster <laughs> ever. But you also had Johnny Unitas. You had Frank Gifford. Um, Charlie Connerly, and I'm sure something that's being talked about in the papers. I'm sure that's something that's being talked about on the, on the broadcast. If there were, you know, were there were there broadcasters? I'm sure there maybe were. Yeah, in 58, I would assume. So, yeah. um, something that's being talked about if there are, if there are like broadcasters on there is that these two teams these two teams played each other during the regular season. Yes, they did. Giants won. Giants won. Talked a lot of shit. Yeah, Charlie Connerly. Char- Charlie Connerly said that, that we had more guts, and they what the Baltimore Colts did, and I love this. I love when teams do this when they use like Baltimore when they use like certain motivational factors yeah. of Baltimore other teams material. Bulletin yeah. board material. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's funny. Art Donovan played for the Colts, mm-hmm. so I want I want to read this. It's, it's made me laugh. I, I had to make note of it. Um, in the last minute of the game, as the Giants let the clock run out, they were standing across the line of scrimmage, laughing at us. I said to myself, you rotten bastards. And I picked up some, some stones on the field and started throwing at them. Man, I wanted another shot at them. So the Giants were some cocky assholes. Yeah. Which is completely different than like what it is today. You know, in the Coughlin Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. I was just going to bring up the Coughlin era. You did this with Tom Coughlin, you're probably cut the next yeah. day. It doesn't yeah. matter your name. Bill Parcells, same way. Yeah. You were never – those teams were never getting bulletin board material like the Giants were giving the Colts back then yeah. with those two guys. So I thought it was just a very funny and, and starch – starch? Stark? Stark? Contrast. I have trouble with that word. Yeah, starch, stark. Drask. I think it's stark. Like a drask. Drask? Vast. Whatever. I don't give a shit. All I'm saying is I think it's absolutely hysterical the Giants were that confident. Yeah. They, they beat them earlier in the year, and, uh, you know, karma's a bitch. Yep. 
Farmer's a bitch. That game put the game of football on the map, at least yes. for the nation. Yep. Um, which, love that. Love that the Giants were part, of, part that. of that. Don't love that they didn't win the game. Uh, but I think it worked out. I think it's kind of cooler on the losing end of it. No, nah, it's not. The Giants lost, though. I, I made a video about this, but uh, the Giants lost, like, a stretch of, like, three cha- – they were they were the Buffalo Bills of losing championship mm. games before the Buffalo Bills did in the yeah. 90s. And it's funny because when you talk about NFL championships, Giants have the most. They have a lot of them, and they lost well, maybe, a lot. Maybe not the most. They lost a lot of them, They too. lost a lot. Well, this they're a pioneer in NFL yeah. history. And uh, just real quick on that, funny story about this game that the Giants were talking about we wish the Giants won. Yeah. They could have and maybe should have won. So it's third and four on the Giants, I want to say – 42-yard mm. line. Yep. Frank Gifford runs to the right side, changes the play. He changes the play in the huddle, mm. Frank Gifford. The Giants get this first down. They ice the clock. They win the game. They win the greatest game ever played. He gets stopped short, but there's some controversy to it. So the guy who made the tackle on the Colts hurts his ankle, mm-hmm. and he's being attended to. So the referee picks the ball up from where Gifford landed. The game stopped, and they're attending to the guy – the referee has no idea where the ball was. The referee puts the ball back down, and then they measure. Mm-hmm. Frank Gifford's a yard short. Frank Gifford went to his grave talking about he knew he got that fourth yard for mm. the first down and the win. Yeah. He knew it. Like, he's like, there was no reason the ref should have picked the ball up. They should have measured it on the spot. I understand he was hurt, but you have to bring that tape out while you know where the ball is right there. So, years later, the referee, he obviously passed away. It's a long time ago. But his son reached out, reaches out to Frank Gifford, and his son goes, before my father passed, and this is the referee, before my father passed, he wanted me to tell Frank Gifford that he was right. Oh, man. That he should have had that first down. I'd rather not win. know it. I'd rather not know, too. <laughs> I'd rather not know it. <laughs> and, and Gifford goes, I mean, you know, I'm validated because I was right, but yeah. it's a little too late. Yeah. So I, I, I thought that was really funny and just a, a part of the game where, you know, nowadays – Teams may go for it. It's on the 46-yard line. The Giants players tried to convince their head coach who, I'm sorry, was it? Jim Lee Howe. Jim Lee Howe, yes. Tried to to go for it, fourth and one on their own 46 to ice the game. But he's like, no. And the Colts go down, tie the game, and eventually win in overtime. So that referee, may may he rot in hell, cost the Giants the chance to to win the greatest game ever played. Uh, Vince Lombardi was the offense coordinator. He's running jet sweep on third and four. Didn't go for it on fourth down. Didn't go for it on fourth down. I don't know how good of a coach he is. People really consider that the greatest coach of all time. <laughs> Can we change the, the the Lombardi Trophy name? <laughs> Fucking joke. Was Landry the D coordinator then? Uh, good question. Give me a second. Because I know they coach on the same staff, right? Yep. Give me a second. Two of the greatest coaches of all time. They were never uh, Giants head coaches. I mean. Fucking scumbags. It's crazy how they even had, you know, they had Belichick too. You know? Yeah, Belichick, yeah. Had Romeo Cornell. Giants also had um, Sean Payton. Jason Garrett. 1958, uh, he was the defense coordinator, Tom Landry. Star set a game. Yes. Pat Summerall was the kicker. Pat Summerall was the kicker. Crazy. John Madden was looking on somewhere. All right. So that's going to do it for our first episode yeah, of... Yeah, baby. Recapping the the Big Fifty, what so, we read. Yes, that's right. So it's the first. We want you to read the first two chapters and then chapter five. Kind of yes. follow along when you get the book. Yes. And we will obviously tweet that out, but just want to make sure you know that those are what we covered. We covered the Duke, Tim Mara, and the greatest game ever played, chapters one, two, and five. Um, a lot of fun. I enjoyed that. A lot of fun. All right, so we will see you next week. Keep on bleeding blue and snacks. Fuck Tiki Barber. Mm.